morning. morning. God is good. Well, all the time. All the time he's good. I'll tell you the same thing I told people in the first service. If I, if I, if I could. Be patient with me. I'm not a young man. I'm getting older. Older in age, but stronger in spirit. God is so amazing in the things that he does. Years ago, uh, growing up in my home, my, my dad worked for Bremen Anchor, he was an engineer. And during those years, I um, watched him very intently as he worked around the house. And my dad, uh, which he had gotten tools from his father who had been an auto mechanic and used to work on racing cars. And in those toolbox, I was quite curious to, to find out what each of the tools meant and what they were used for. And it wasn't until uh, later on in life that I understood that tools are an important part of our everyday lives. Women use them every day. Men use them every day, even though we might not think. When you went to the kitchen to cook, ladies, you they call cooking utensils their tools that you are able to prepare a meal. And without those tools, it would be difficult to get the spaghetti out of a pot, flip a hamburger over, unless you're one of those kind of guys or girls. Tools are important in all of our lives. Shirley's not here the second service he had gone home. And what I had mentioned earlier in the first service was that uh, in my own toolbox, I still work, I work for Otis Elevator Company. I've been in the elevator business for over 50 years. I work in the Empire State Building. Um, and um, I know that these things are important. I, I'm totally vaccinated, so I feel kind of good about that. Uh, in the Empire State Building now, we have um, on a, any given day, on any given normal day, there would be between the average of 35 and 40,000 people that worked in the Empire State Building. Right now, we have about 500 people. Um, so it, there's a big impact on financially, emotionally, on people, and I get it, I, I understand that. But you know what? There's a God who's in control. He doesn't uh, allow anything to go unnoticed. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to, to the Psalms. And I'd like you to turn to Psalm 139 for a moment. I'm going to read it for you. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Psalm 139 talks about God's understanding of you and me. God's understanding of allowing you to understand using this tool about who you are. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Now that's a thought to live with. That God searches you and he knows everything about you. How many of you know that God doesn't let anything get hidden under the, under the covers, behind closed doors? God sees everything. That's why you don't need to be frustrated about life. God sees and knows everything. He knows everything about you and me. Don't think that so. You know my down-sitting, my uprising. Thou understand my thought far off. God understands and knows you so much, He knows what you're going to think before you think it. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. God's very well acquainted with you. You know why? Before you were formed in mommy's belly, He knew you. Wow. I must really be important, right? Well, I'm going to get my toolbox out this morning, grab one of my tools, and look at the Word of God. Thou compassionate my path, with my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Guess what? You're not hiding on God. 
You can't get away from the presence of God. If you're not a believer in Jesus, if you never accepted Christ as your Savior, He knows everything about you. He knows where you're going, what you're doing, He knows what you're thinking about. God is good all the time. And I say that all the time. God is good. God is great. God loves me. He knows everything about me. God wishes no ill towards me, nor you. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. God is good. <clears throat> Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Where am I going to go? Where am I going to hide from the spirit of God? You can't hide from God. I can't hide from God. God knows everything about me. He knows everything about you. If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there too. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Is it hardly comforting words to know that God knows everything about you, where you're going, what you're doing, and that he's there to hold you in the palm of his hand? He knows everything about each one of us. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the night shall be light about me, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and light are both alike to thee. You see, when things are bad and not going your way, it doesn't ruffle God. In a world in which we live, and he sees the whole pandemic thing, and the racial divide, and the uprising, and the hatred, and the bitterness, none of that is surprising to God. I know how the story ends, and it ends with those who believe and trust in him in heaven. Why? Because he said it so. How do I know that? I took out my tool, the Bible, read it, and I understand that that is what God says to me. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Listen, God don't make junk. How many of you know that? Your children are precious. You're precious. Your parents are or were precious. Nothing that God makes is junk. I don't care if you're a Muslim, Hindu, black, white, Asian. God loves people. He's in the people business. You are fearfully, they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Why? Because God said it so. You know why I believe that? Because God said it so. Now, how many of you know? I believe what God says to you. I believe what he says. If he says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, I, hey, I, I didn't make myself. God made me. You see, our problem in society is we, we think everybody ought to be like us, not how God created them to be. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That eyes in verse 16. That eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members are written, which is in continuance or fashion, when as yet there was none of them. Listen, I'm unperfect. I live in a world of unperfect people. Believers and unbelievers alike. But I know one who is perfect. And he's taking all of my members because I've taken the tool, the Word of God, and allowing it to become part of my life. I'm allowing it to be infused in my life that I can be different. Verse 17. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. And am I not grieved with these, with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them 
my enemies. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Psalm 139 is probably one of the most powerful psalms. Still, the whole entirety of the Word of God is powerful. But it talks about me. It, it declares who I am in God's eyes, in God's sight. How he made me, how he formed me. How he's watched over my life up until this point in time. How many of you know that God is watching over you even this morning? Even the thoughts that you're having right now, God knows what you're thinking. God knows every part of your members. What's going on in your heart? Now, earlier today, this morning, and I was looking at the prayer list of all those individuals that are sick and have cancer and autoimmune deficiencies and uh, all, all different tumors and cancer and all those things. How many of you know that God is acquainted with all those members? He knows what the body parts, what they're doing and how they function. God isn't asleep at the throne. He's, a, he's alive and he's got the wheel. Our world, although it's, it seems to us that it's rapidly unwinding, it's, it's to the point where we begin to get frightened at what we see in our society, in our world. You know what? None of us caught God by chance. He knows exactly what's going on. If you go turn back to the book of Genesis, <clears throat> my, uh, having been in the construction trade most of my life, I pastored a church for several years out on Long Island. I, I, I pastored while I worked. That's very difficult to do, but it was probably one of the most joyful times in my life to be able to have influence on people's lives, all because of one man and one woman, and I'm not talking about Jesus and his mother. I'm talking about a man and a, a man who I worked with who saw God's worth in me. Even though I was worthless to me, he saw God's worthiness in me, worthfulness in me. And for years and years, on February 5th, 1975, I remember it was cold, there was snow outside. My wife had gone bowling at the time. Uh, they, they, they didn't go to church that night. It was a Wednesday. I remember it was a Wednesday night. You can probably Google it and see the date and time. It was, it was a Wednesday. I know they missed praying to, to to come to my home and witness to me. And how many of you know that the Spirit of God knows when to show up? That night he showed up, and everything that they had, my, my friend had witnessed to me about for a, a long time, probably two and a half, three years, witnessed to me. And I, I, you know, I called him every name in the book. I told him he was a fanatic, he was Bible thumpers, and that, 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 you know, all the hurtful things that we can say to people. Everything that he said to me, I can recount those words by memory. That God's Spirit just infused in my life, and for the first time, I could see with spiritual eyes what he was saying to me about my relationship with God. God is in the restoration business, you know that. When things look like they're actually falling apart, how many of you know that God is restoring people's lives? We all look at this pandemic as being something terrible. You know what? Why are you all surprised? Why? Jesus said in the last days these things were going to happen. He said there's going to be wars, pestilence, famine, as which the world never seen before. Hatred, men giving the natural affection of their bodies to that which is unnatural, women likewise. All of these things are befalling us, and, and we see these things happening with Lord. Oh, what a mess. Oh my, oh my God, the end is near. True. I prepared a sermon on Ezekiel on Gog and Magog, and God said, don't do it. While I was sleeping for three nights, he gave the same, the same dream over and over and over. was, I want you to preach about your tools. What? I'm saying to myself in my dream, I'm not awake, I'm saying this in my dream. What? Talk about my tools. The, the tools that you use at work, the things that you use every day, daily, in and out, to perform the work that you perform. 
So the first service, I, I said some things. You, I'm sure you take a note, right? <laughs> I said the same thing at the, at the first service. In my toolbox, I have this tool. It's long. It's got a round end on one side. It's got teeth in it. And the other side is like a fork. Anybody know what it is? It's a wrench. It's a wrench. It's a combination wrench. Box uh, and, and a fork wrench. And because of that, you can use that tool on a lot of things. But you can't use it on everything. You can't use it as a hammer. Although I've seen people who are not tradesmen use, you know, the shoot a drive in a nail. Uh, you know, use all different kinds of things that are a tool that's not designed to be used for. How many of you know that uh, Jesus' earthly dad was a carpenter? He grew up in a home where his father was a carpenter. His earthly father was a carpenter. And he saw his father use carpenter tools. A hammer, a, mo uh, a mallet, uh, a chisel, uh, uh, all different kinds of tools that a carpenter would use in a trade. So he was familiar with tools and, and how things were made. Even so much so that he even knew that most, uh, most carpenters and, and during that period of time, made crosses for people to be crucified on. Some of the tools that we use in our own personal toolboxes are used to hurt people and not help people. The things that we say to people, the, the way that we look down upon people who don't look exactly like us or come or speak the same language as perfectly as I do. And we look down on people. See, we use a lot of bad tools. We don't use the tools from the toolbox. And why do I say that to be true? The great architect, God, in the very beginning, writes these words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was without form. You know, when you take a piece of lumber and you're going to build a house, it isn't a house until you see a piece of lumber on the ground. Until you put the pieces together to form a house. Most people build things. You know that? You build a home. Not the physical home. You build a home with your family, with your children. Most of us are builders and some of us are battlers. We have a, mil we have a, a military that fights battles for us. Well, the earth was without form. It wasn't built yet. It wasn't created yet. But he saw the earth that it really wasn't the way that God had envisioned the world to be. So what does he do? He separates the water from the earth. And in that, he also sees that there's darkness upon the face of the deep. So the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, the key component is, write it, underline it in your Bible, the Spirit of God moved. The Spirit of God moved. The Spirit of God moved. Every great awakening in America and around the world was because the Spirit of God moved. He moved. Have you been moved by the Spirit of God? Have you ever had an encounter with God? So much so that He moved you to do something that you wouldn't ordinarily do? Love somebody, embrace somebody, reach out to somebody, do something for somebody because the, you were so overwhelmed by the presence of the Spirit of God in your life, you couldn't help but not to do that. But you know what? It wasn't until God began to move and God began to create that God's Spirit moved upon the earth and then God said, let there be light. Isn't it unique that He first created light out of everything? Most people walk in darkness. And like my, my friend Vincent Canero, who has passed on now, led me to the Lord. He brought the light of God into my life. Now, granted, God knew the day of my salvation. But Vinny exposed me, and out of his toolbox, took the Word of God, shared it with me, so that I could be sensitive to the things of God. God called the night the light day. And darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And he continues on with the days of creation. I do want you to 
know and understand one thing this morning. Every day in your life counts, for good or bad. Every day when you get up, it, make it count. Make it count that you've made an impression upon your community, your home. I'm going to rewind the clock. Your home, your community, society in general. That you take a stand for that which is right. How many of you know it's never right to do wrong? Never. And it never will be. Psalm 139 again. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand lead me and thy hand shall hold me. Do you remember when Jesus took his buddies out? I actually went along for a fishing trip. He goes out with the boys and, you know, they were all fishing all day and they knew how to fish. They were fishermen. They were professional fishermen. And how many of you know that the boat was wooden so it had to be made by carpenters? They didn't have steel boats back then. So they were familiar with all the tools that went into making the ship and that the ship had to be sturdy enough to prevail against violent winds, strong storms, high seas. And all day they're fishing in nets that they made. How do I know that? Because they did make them nets and then they mended them after they broke. They're fishing all day, they catch nothing. How many of you are like that? You fish and you fish and you fish and you catch nothing. And then Jesus says, guys, you've been fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Take your net up, throw it in the other Walk on the other side of the ship and catch your net on that side of the boat. They do that, and lo and behold, they had so much fish that the ship was, the, the boat was ready to sink. That they were struggling to get it onto the ship. How many of you know if you're on the right side where God calls you to go, the harvest is so plenteous? Calvary Church needs to be on the side of the ship. That when they cast their net out into Baldwin, Freeport, this whole entire area, that the harvest will be, forget about this church, this thing's too small. And it isn't for numbers, for numbers sake, it's souls. God is interested in souls. He's interested in your life, my life. He's interested in our children's lives. Why? Because he knows everything about us. He knows that we were created to worship him. And to love him with our whole heart, our whole life, our whole being. God created us for that purpose and that purpose alone. God did not create me to make a lot of money. God did not create you to make a lot of money. And I've told this story in church a time or two. Bear with me. I had a friend in New Jersey when I went to Bible college. And then I went to, um, I went to Northeastern Bible College. And then I did my internship at Calvary Evangelical Free Church in Essex Fells, New Jersey. And in that church, there was one man that I knew uh, very well. He was, he was on a, a men's committees and uh, just a lovely man. His name was Ted Toom. He's since passed away too. He owned a pharmaceutical company and two machine manufacturing companies. Ted Toom gained 90% of his income from his business to foreign missions. Let me say it again. 90% of what his corporations made, he gave to foreign missions because he knew this worth of a soul. How many of you know God knows everything about you? He knows what you're worth. When we live in a world that always constantly wants to put people down, stomp, just stomp people into the ground because it'll look, act, breathe the same way I do. Or you do. Or our society deems that the way it should be. Ted was a marvelous man. You would never know he was a multimillionaire many times around. I remember, I remember he drove a 69 Chevrolet Caprice. Four door, hideous green color. I don't know what they were thinking back in those days, but it was just a hideous looking car. You would never picture him as being a multimillionaire. The things in this world did not captivate him. The things in the next world he had his eyes focused on. Because he believed in Psalm 139 that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. And God had a purpose and a plan for his life. And if he would just get into the toolbox, 
Find out what that purpose was, and that it was to change people's lives for the better. Then that's exactly what you would do. God wants so much for each one of us to glorify Him, to exalt Him, to worship Him. The Scripture says the Lord taketh pleasure in Him and fear Him, in those that hope in His mercy. And when I came to know Christ as my Savior, I said, well, I don't think God could ever, ever forgive me for the things I've done, even for the things I've said about Him. Why would God want to forgive me? Because he loves me, and he knows what my worth is. And he loves you, and he knows what your worth is as well. So in working with the tools that God has given to me, and I go into my toolbox, the Word of God, and I see what God says to me about my life. In my uprising and in my downsetting, I am to praise him and worship him from in the early morning till the late evening. And even when I sleep at night, God talks to me in my sleep. I guess I wasn't listening, listening close enough during the day that he had to get me during my sleeping hours. Sometimes that's the way God is. Sometimes God just needs to get our attention. Sometimes we need to call out to God for him to cause us to pay attention. I remember when I was a young kid going to school, and my teacher said, Howard, H Howard, pay attention. You know, I'd be drifting off somewhere. I'd be going into the land of Nod. It's East Eden, by the way. <laughs> and uh, all that time that I wasted where I could have been learning and growing, and uh, I just really wasn't that interested in those things at that time. But my whole life was transformed by a simple act by a simple man who loved me. Who cared about me enough to tell me that God loves me and that God cares about me. And, I, and I'll tell you, Vinny was the, the, the type of man, after 9-11 happened, he went down and volunteered to work down at not down the work site at 9-11, help cleaning up the debris. From that, Vincent ended up with a, uh, a bad lung disease from all the chemicals that were used. And at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, which I was familiar with, and he was as well, he would uh, have to go to the hospital, come home, do treatment, therapy. Then he was on the organ donor list for new lungs. And then they, they put him on the organ donor list. He was on the donor list. Uh, a set of lungs were made available to him. They were given him anti-rejection medication. But that didn't work. So they had to take him back off the list because his body was doing all crazy things. And they didn't, to be frank, they didn't want to waste a good pair of lungs on somebody that potentially just wasn't going to live. Well, Vinny, you know, God wasn't done with him yet. I mean, he witnessed everybody in the hospital, all the nurses, all the doctors. I mean, that, he, he, it was in him. It was in him to do that. He was born to do that. Not a street evangelist, not a guy that would be at a pulpit talking to thousands of people, just one-on-one, -on -one caring and loving people. Vinny eventually did get a, a set of lungs, and uh, he was on the anti-rejection medication, I remember. He worked for, <coughs> at that time, he worked for a company called, um, ooh, I can't think of the name of the company, it's, really, it's a pretty big company, uh, but anyway, he worked for an elevator company, and they allowed him to come back to work with an oxygen bottle, working on electrical components. How many of you know that? Electricity and oxygen don't normally work too well together. But that they were gracious enough to allow them to come back to work and work on uh, installing, doing wiring on, <coughs> excuse me, elevator controllers. And while he was working on them, of course, they, they disconnected all the electric, so he could just wire everything up. <coughs> and then later on, um, about two years later, his body began to reject the lungs. And he, and he died from that. When I talked to the doctor, the doctor said his lungs, they literally, when they took his lungs out, before they put in the lungs in, they literally were like ash in his hand. They just fell apart. 
disintegrated. But all the way to the end of his life, and even till this day, his testimony stands as a testimony to God of God's love and forgiveness and grace. Wouldn't you love to meet somebody like that? You know somebody like that. That has that compassion and fire in their belly to go and to witness to the world. So that may be you. Maybe God, who saw you before you were born, has placed that in you and you don't know it yet. That fire to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The sign is going to be put up in the back of the church. You are now entering the mission field. Mission field's not here, it's out there. It's in Freeport, it's in Baldwin, it's in Rockville Center. And where I live, in Plainview, which is predominantly Jewish, I live on my block, and I witness to my neighbors, they are, they are Jews by name. They don't attend synagogue. They go for uh, Rosh Hashanah, uh, to the High Holy Days. Yom Kippur. They'll, they'll go for that and then it's kind of like the Christian church. We come for Easter. Easter and Christmas. How sad. There should be another sign on the outside saying, well, we only attend Easter and Christmas. We need to share the gospel to everybody. The world is rapidly unwinding. The time peace is closing down, folks. Read the book of Ezekiel. If you want to, you want to see how everything's winding down and how it's going to end, it's not China. It's Russia. The land of God you made up. It's coming. Look at what's happening to our society. We've managed to hate everybody. We hate our kids. We hate our schools. We hate our school teachers. And we hate the preacher. Where did they come? How, how did he become so negative? Why? We did not embrace this book. I knew you before I formed you. I only have good to you, for you, not hurt, not harm, but a future and a hope. Why has our society gotten so bad? Why? In my toolbox, it tells me, for all we are like sheep, we've gone astray. Everyone's turned his own way. We need to come back to God. Give our hearts back in a renewed and fresh way. Back to God and tell God, I am sorry. How many times have you ever said that to God? I am truly, truly sorry for the way that I've been living. I say that of myself every day. I'm sorry, Lord. Teach me. And he does. And sometimes it's not real pleasant. But he teaches me. I am thankful that God has not given up on me. Why? Because he knew me before I was even formed in my mother's womb. Children are a gift from God. God knew all about that little person right there. Before you were born, God knew all about you and what you were going to do with your life. We can either embrace th that person or person, children, we need to embrace each other that God has a future and a hope for everybody in this room. But unless we take the tool, the Word of God, and apply it to our lives, our everyday lives, it may, may be simplistic what I'm saying, but it is simplistic. Take the Word of God every day and apply it to your life. Apply something to your life. Are you unlovely? Are you unforgiving? How many unforgiving? You've got somebody to just irritate the heart out of you. Number one, they shouldn't irritate you. Why? God, I never irritated God. God never gave up on me. God never gave up on you. Maybe that person that irritates you is Jesus Christ. Possibly. What do you think? I, I see people in church, but uh, I don't like the color of the carpet. I'm going to go to another church. Believe it or not, I have a time friend, he's uh, Pastor Emeritus at North Fort Baptist Church. It's a different name now, I don't know what it is. But, uh, he, he, he told me once of his congregation, he had to split his congregation over the color of the curtains in a fellowship hall. Can you imagine a church split over the color of curtains in a lost and dying world? Are you kidding me? But you know what? It was the best thing that ever happened to them. All those negative, nasty people left. Now they have five satellite churches. Well, 
not just places grew. It just was like an explosion took place. You see, sometimes you have to deal with sin. And it's not pleasant. You know what? God's going to deal with sin too. The scripture says, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. And he wasn't talking about an earthly death. He was talking about a spiritual death. They will surely die a spiritual death. That's why I look at my grandchildren in a different way. I don't want my children to die that kind of a death. I want them to learn about Christ. I want them to love and embrace Jesus Christ as their Savior. But you know what? Unless you're willing to take your tool, tool book out every day and use it for His honor and for His glory, it will, your life would have meant nothing in the eternal scope of things. God has called you to go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If crickets could get saved, I would want crickets to get saved. And let it be transformed so they don't make that annoying sound anymore. <laughs> but God's concerned about souls. He's concerned about people. Why? Because he created them. And in the garden, where the fall all took place, the serpent was there. And guess what? The serpent is out every day to destroy your family, destroy our nation, destroy uh, our school system, destroy everything that we love and hold dear in our society. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. God is so big. He is so great. And yet, we kind of put him in a box, in a, a church box, a religious box, uh, and we just put the lid on it, and a couple of days and during the week, we take him out of the box, and oh, yes, God. Yeah I, 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 yeah, I remember, I remember what you, you said. And then we put it back in the box and put the lid on it. God is not a man. That we should treat him as a man. He is my father. He is my Savior. Without His Spirit, I can do nothing. 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 Above all things, that we should be able to understand and comprehend is that God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Him alone. And there was a song that was written, God and God alone. He is fit. And we need to put him on that rightful place in our lives. That God needs to be on the throne of our lives. Replace our throne with his throne. Replace our ways with his ways. Replace our thoughts with his thoughts. And I think when we do that, life gives breath and new meaning to my life as a person. Am I perfect? No. Will I be perfect? Yes. One day I will be perfected in Him. I struggle just like everyone else. I do things I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. And the very things I should do, I find myself not doing. You see, this is an elitist club. We're all in the same boat together. And if we'll all get on the other side and fish over here, become fishers of men, Our, this boat will be so full. You'll be building up, out, down, dead, knock the building down, put another building up. Why? Because God loves people. God loves souls. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and at the end of his or her very life loses, listen to me, loses their own soul? What have you profited? You lived life for 50, 60, 70 years, like a game? And then at the end of your life, you go to this place called hell? 
Gehenna, a place that burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever 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 and ever. I can keep saying it. It's not going to stop. Do you want your next door neighbor to go to heaven or hell? Do you want your children to go to heaven or hell? Hell is forever. Heaven is forever. Choose you this day who you will serve. Me and my house, guess who we're serving? The Lord. Not because I'm perfect, but because He is perfect. Because He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. In Him, you find hope. You find joy. You find peace in a very disturbing world. I pray for our government. Do I think what's going on is wrong? Absolutely. But you know what? God sets up kings and kingdoms for purposes. And it may be just for a time like this that God's calling his children and saying, stand up, speak up, tell people about me and my love for them, and then the world will change. Forever and ever and ever. Hell is a reality, and so is heaven. One day, when he calls us all home, we will know as we've been known. We will see things in a totally, totally different way. God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. Jesus was obedient. He obeyed his father. They say, I, I don't know, you know, come on, Dad, really? You think you've got to kidding me? No. He was obedient to his father even unto death. His father, in the very beginning of creation, created the tree he knew would be used for an old rugged cross. Amazing. But he also saw you. And you, 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 he saw all of us in his eternal plan. And he sees great worth in you, each other, as a congregation of believers, that you can make a difference. We can make a difference. Collectively as a church, we can make a difference. Isn't it good to know that you can be part of something greater than yourself? That we can be part of seeing people's lives change so that they can spend eternity in heaven. Jesus wrote these words, and, and it's very important for us to think about it. When Jesus was tempted, and you remember he went out to the wilderness and he was being tempted by the devil day in and day out, day in and day out. Some of you have been tempted day in and day out, day in and day out. The tempter comes to him, but, you know, he tempts him with all these things. Oh, you know, just throw yourself off the, the cliff and fall on the rocks and, and everything will be all right. I want to really see if you're the guy who's, you claim that you are. And he said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Go to his toolbox. And he'll tell you what he has to do. The devil taketh him up, on the, on, uh, up into the holy city, setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Isn't that your day? I don't know how many of you work in a hospital, or if any of you do. Uh, I've seen people scream on their deathbed. And I've seen people say, Ah, my father was Oh, it's so beautiful. Close his eyes and went to heaven. There is an enormous disadvantage the way people die. Helen, uh, uh, Helen, uh, Helen, Helen, Helen Kubler-Ross wrote a book called Death and Dying. There is an enormous difference between the way believers pass from life and non-believers pass from life. 
And if you're ever in one of those settings and you see it, you'll understand. And it'll even give you more strength for your faith. It is written, don't tempt the Lord. And then he had to tell Satan, get behind me. You ain't got nothing to do with you. Get behind me. We need to say, well, we're tempted. Get, get, get. Hit the road, Joe. Get out. Get away. Get away from me. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then Jesus said, there I am with this. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When I go to work every day, I reach into my toolbox and get a tool that I need to use on a specific task. Technology has changed so much that at 72 years of age, it's hard for me to keep up with technology. It's growing so much faster and so much harder to play the game, the catch-up game. In, in our society with technology. But you know what? God has always got time. I, mean, I don't have to play catch up all with God. God's always been there. His word is plain and simple. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto salvation. He believes with his heart. And his mouth he confesses that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Savior. Have you done it? Have you said yes to Jesus? Have you committed your heart and life to Christ? If not, why not? It would be the best decision that you ever made in your entire life. It would be the best thing that you ever did in your life. Let us pray. Father, thank you for who you are and that you love us no matter what. You love us because you first loved us and that you told us that you first loved us in the very beginning of time in creation that you formed us, you saw every member, you, you, you knew everything about us before we were born. You knew how we were going to turn out. And yet, Father, we know that from time to time we don't actually do the things that you say we should do, nor love you the way we should, nor be as concerned about the world as you have been from the very beginning. You created out of chaos a planet that we were to have enjoyed, and yet because of sin we destroyed it. And it's been going on for 8,000 years of recorded history of the Bible. That we see and know and understand that it is up to us, each individual, to love you and to serve you and to serve our mankind. Because you love the world. You love our neighbors. You love people that are unlovely. You, you love people that hate you. As hard as it is for me to comprehend and understand that, you love people who hate you. You didn't come into the world to save the righteous, you came into the world to save sinners. Help us to be mindful. Help us to understand that there are people that, that are hurting, hurtful, that need Jesus. God, I pray, create in us a fire that can only come from heaven. Create within this church a fire that will ablaze anew in this ministry. That this church in Baldwin would be known as the church that loves and cares about its community and the world. Let people want to come here to find out what they heard about what's happening here in Baldwin, this little tiny church, where it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Help us, Father, to be that spark in your kingdom. And I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name.